everybody. Thank you for inviting us into your living room. Thank you to my audience. My name is Ingrid Lemmy, and this is my show, American Dream. A show about people, their hopes, their dreams, their family heritage, and their unbelievable realities. And my guest today, ladies and gentlemen, is Tova Felchuk. She's blonde, she's brunette, she's blonde, she's brunette. <laughs> Only her hair color is snows. As a matter of fact, she is brunette today. I, I am a brunette. Last I, night, she was a blonde. Yes, I have a wonderful wig mistress. Mm -hmm. And last night, she had a wonderful, another wonderful standing ovation. Well, I... opening I, party. People come to their feet for Irena Gutopteik. I always feel that a standing ovation is our human beings standing for their own aliveness. It's a thank you from the house that says, thank you for making me feel like that. Mm -hmm. Not just like this, but like that. And if this stuff weren't true about this Christian rescuer, you, you, you wouldn't be able to write it because you wouldn't be able to dream it up. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't be able to dream it up. And it also has to do with the principle of Shoshan. Shoshan is the um, Asian word for beginner's mind. Mm -hmm. The fact that this marvelous person was in the brink of her womanhood, was a teenager separated by 200 miles from her family and her sisters and her mother and her father. It's very important because in Poland, to help the enemy of the Reich was punishable by death. So she was separated from those who could hang with her. It's a very important psychological factor. And she was able to make up on her own as a simple kid. You know, she wasn't, Irena Gut wasn't going to be the CEO. Well, of course, who wants to be a CEO at this moment in the United States? But she, she wasn't slated to be the president of Harvard University. She was a wonderful girl, well brought up, studying to be a student nurse, you know. As she says in her tapes with the Shoah Institute, in my day, we did not study politic. I was trained to be wife and mother. That is what a woman does, your wife and mother, not politic. Now, today, people are politic. So this is the person that batted a 1,000 and saved 13 out of 13 uh, human beings in the basement of the highest-ranking German officer in Tarnopol, Galicia at that time, but what is now the Ukraine. And uh, she did it by her simple decency, moral code, and simple intelligence. And, and she succeeded. It, it was a miracle. Would, would, would we do the same? I don't know. We all must remember that in Holland, when Meep helped save Anne Frank's family, and Anne Frank's family was rounded up by the Gestapo, Meep was not killed. She wasn't hung in the town square. In the general government, which is what the Polish area was called, under, that, under the Reich, you were killed along with the Jews or gypsies, or homosexuals, or communists, or righteous Christians you saved who talked against the right. And as we all know, it's been stated ad nauseum, uh, if you were a righteous Christian who talked against the Reich, you'd go to concentration camp just like the Jews. But the Jews and the gypsies were the only two people singled out for extermination just because they were who they were, not because of what they said or did. So it's a tough. Tough, interesting thing, and this is, of course, about this Christian rescuer, Irena Gutovna. I don't think there's anybody better for this interview than myself, because I'm able to mention my grandfather who uh, was actually killed for that very reason. So I should be here doing this interview, guys, with this woman who has an amazing family heritage herself. I do. I'm part Austrian. A Feldschuh, of course, means field shoe. It's not a... I think the Jewish, I'm an American, or I'm a Jewish, an American who is of the Jewish religion. And I guess I want to put it that way. It's not that I don't, it's very important to me, my religion, but I'm an American, like you. I, I love this country. God bless America. Yeah. Well, I don't think any immigrant group can take for granted. My husband's family has a chair at the Juilliard, and the Juilliard, if you'll forgive me, was always dominated by Yitzhak Perlman and the Jewish kids. Yeah. Not nowadays. Those phenomenal Asian, usually Korean kids are valedictorizing the greatest schools in our country, along with MIT, where my daughter is. It's a third Asian, because this is a great country. 
because the, at the fundament of this country is the idea of a meritocracy, that if you work hard and you, and, you go, and you push yourself toward excellence, you can succeed in this country, not because of your daddy, but because of who you are and what you did. And that's, that's a wonderful thing. And even though this country makes mistakes, it is right-minded. It is right-minded. Don't forget that when yeah. we vote. You went to Poland. I went to Poland. So my family's Austrian uh, from 18 Pratestrasse in Vienna and, and British. My, mother's, my grandmother was British. But before they were Austrian and British, the Galician Jews from Poland came down into the Austro-Hungarian Empire around in the 1880s. And that probably is what happened with our family because they are buried in Section A of the Jewish Cemetery outside of Vienna, and Hitler never got to that section, so I was able to see my great-grandmother's grave. My mother, who's from London, I mean, her family's from London, before London, that was the migration out of Belarus and Minska Bernia uh, uh, to Danzig and then on to England, which was the first bastion of freedom from that, for them and the first ability to escape uh, institutionalized pogroms. I mean, the Tsar really wrought havoc in the Russian Empire mm -hmm. because he institutionalized the blood libel, which was that every Easter the Jews were accused of making matzahs out of Christian children's mm. blood. And when you even think of the logic, I mean, if you accuse a Jew of making, uh, using Christian children's blood to make borscht, I could see it. But matzah, I mean, matzah is beige, it's brown, it doesn't have much to do with blood of anybody. So from, from this terrible ignorance came a lot of death and suffering. And um, uh, in all events, what I'm saying to you is I went to Poland, but I found out that my ties we're also from Bershiv, which is a, a, a town that lies between Tarnopol and Lviv in the Ukraine, and that was Galicia. And looking for her, one of the, f one of the wildest things I found was our, one of our family homes still exists, mm -hmm. and it's documented, and, even, and the, the relative's name was Meritz Felchu, and it says MF 1928, mm, right in the, right in the wall. Feeling. It was an amazing, amazing yes. feeling. It was a German bar house. It was a beautiful, simple mansion. It was never destroyed because St. Ernestine's Hospital took it over after the war and it became the administrative building for this hospital so it stands yes so i went i went and i i uh, did a lot of research being every night being becoming irena yes um it must be intense very very painful i was with your miss one of your masseuses today at this wonderful spa where you know it's probably unsaid, but we come and do this show, and uh, he at Gurney's. That's what she's at Gurney's. About. And dear Ingrid says, you know, you're knocking yourself out for me. What can we give you? So <laughs> today I had a body scrub, a massage, and a facial. <laughs> when I was on the table with the, the on the my back with the masseuse, and the masseuse was massaging my back, and she said, "My God, you're so, you're fighting me." I said, "I'm not fighting you." She said, "You're so tight here." I said, "That is because I do a play about terror." and you do it night after night, that's where the play is taxing. You know, when I played Golda Meir, the, it was the 1973 Yom Kippur War, and she had to find a way out of the war, and she was a think tank. It was a very historical play, and there was stress, but there wasn't wholesale fear that ran, ran the, uh, through the bottom of the play. In this piece, it, sometimes the piece has humor. It, it almost is on the brink of farce, because you can't believe these people are going to make it through the next pitfall. And it's true, in saving a Jew or saving an enemy of the Reich, you could do 99 things right, and if you made a mistake on the 100th, you were dead. Yeah. And I don't mean dead like kind of dead, I mean like finished, over and out. So uh, there's a lot of honestly felt fear when you do the play, and if you're any good at acting, your body doesn't know that you're lying. You follow me? Yeah. You so educate the, the, the cells and the muscles and the axion and dendrites of the nervous system to take on the cloak of another person's life and dreams. You so educate the triggers in your body that trigger terror, whatever that is. I remember at Monroe Play School, I was, in a, I was at a tube. I sat on my tube in the brook, and the tube hit me on the head, and I went under, and I started to drown. And there are nights on stage when I see that drowning scene where I'm drowning. Mm -hmm. uh, and I use that image to trigger this fear. And uh, unfortunately, it, show, it showed up today at Gurney's. I realized, gee, I better get more massage <laughs> to kind of release this stuff, because it's not a healthy thing to lock into the body. So what she said is, Listen to this. Remember that your body doesn't know that you are lying. 
that she is that pretending, right. that she is acting. And with that, guys, you go to the refrigerator, you, you don't go anywhere, and we will be back. <laughs> <laughs> Whether you are looking for a total work environment or a combination of business and relaxation, Gurney's Inn Resort, Spa, and Conference Center will provide you with the best of both worlds. Our experienced conference staff will ensure your business gathering will run without a hitch. We have your business solutions. Contact our conference center now. She's still here. She's not going anywhere. As you are staying with me. Our audience is packed today, guys. Uh, it's Tova Felchu. She is right now still off Broadway. Yes, in Arena's Vow by yeah. Dan Gordon, who was an Oscar nominee for the movie Hurricane. He's actually a screenwriter. And um, I understand from Jeannie Updike Smith, who is the daughter mm -hmm. of Arena mm -hmm. Goot mm -hmm. Updike that the reviews have been very strong and some of them say what it would be a brilliant movie well you have a screenwriter writing the play no so wonder. in a way that the the savvy critics are Just intuiting that it's cin it's cinematic the play is done yeah. cinematically which is what's so delicious about it what's it like working with dan gordon he's extremely um uh, collegial he's very kind and he's if if you know what you're doing if he feels you know what you're doing and he trusts you, he's, he's very malleable. I've asked him for a lot of changes. He's really given them all to me. He's also given me, the word isn't free reign, but he's given me breathing space with the sculpting of a line. Mm -hmm. So let's say the line is, I watched, from I watched from behind the fence. I watched them herd a group of people. I say, but I hid. And I watched from behind the fence. And he lets me slightly um, specify through my experience the line. We get on great. And this director, Michael Parva, is a relentless um, uh, searcher for uh, truth and containment. Very, very interesting. It's probably the simplest work I've done in, in many years because it's demanded of me. When I say simplest, I mean on, on stage. And in, on movies, in movies you can't. The, the camera takes your thoughts. Your thoughts are, in fact, your actions. On stage, you have to fill time and space. On camera, you feel time. You feel tr truth through just time, through the pause, through the look. Anyway, this is a very good director, and uh, he's been very rigorous. And the story's strong to begin with. It's really a strong story. People sob. And, and, and in the Q&A, when Jeannie is with us, which is such an asset, and people ask her questions, there is audience after audience. They ask her the same questions. Nobody knows anybody. One comes on a Tuesday night, one on a Wednesday, one on a Thursday. They ask the same questions. When did your mother tell you the story? Did your mother ever see the Jews again that she saved? Did she ever see Major Rugamir? You know, Jeannie's mother, as an 18-year-old child, had to give her body to a 67-year-old man in order to save the lives of these Jewish people that she had hid in his basement once he found out. And uh, she was a devout Catholic. So the whole thing was so... Yeah, was so exactly right. Exactly right, actually. I think, and that's probably the image that she was able to give herself for her in, for her to survive that experience, because she was repeatedly um, was asked to have intercourse with somebody she not only didn't love, but it was not it's not what she wanted to do. Of course not. Of course not. She was beautiful. She was young. Very and, young. Uh, was very pretty. Very much she older was, and dominating. Right. She was like Zsa, Zsa in the trenches. You know, <laughs> she was really very, very, very tried. I love being blonde. My mother is blonde. My mother looks a little like you. So my mother is going deaf, and she said, Tauva, I couldn't hear a thing, but you look gorgeous. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, this is how she looks on stage. Drop dead gorgeous. I thank you. And I got to tell you, um, I don't know if my husband is here in the audience, but he looked at the cover and he said, "Wow!" <laughs> and I said, "You better hold on, honey." <laughs> you know, so drop uh, dead gorgeous. Nah. Um, I must tell you, when I called you and I asked you to beg you to be a guest on my show today, because of our affiliation with. Montauk, Debbie Toomer, and of course her uh, cousin, etc., etc., etc. Well, actually, her aunt, right, Debbie? Yes. 
Yes, I always get this wrong. That is um, when I felt I was afraid. I was afraid to call you and ask you if you wanted to be my guest because I am German. I am of German descent. Ingrid, as I told you, German saved my father's life. So nothing, nothing is black or wh white. And I think the difference between being somewhat intelligent and, and the possibility of being brilliant is the possibility of the sharp pencil, the specifics, the subtleties, and the differences. My father's mother was German. My father's father was Austrian. So he learned German and English. He was born in New Jersey. He was put in the United States Infantry because he was a fine athlete at 32 years old. He was already married, practiced law, was a, was a Harvard boy, had got, gotten a scholarship. So his father arrived in 1905. He was born in 1910. And because of this country, he got a scholarship to Harvard a law school, even under a silent quota system where they did watch what, how many minorities they let in. But he was strong. In all events, he was put in the infantry, which was very inappropriate for my father. Yeah. And he begged for an intelligence test. And it was his fluency in German that got him into the United States intelligence under, in, 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 in what's called G2 under Dwight David Eisenhower. And he was one of those men that helped General Eisenhower plan D-Day. And he hit the beaches of Normandy at D-Day plus five and went into the underground. And that is what saved him. Boy. And in the final days of my father's life, he only spoke German. So I have a very uh, different feeling about uh, German. Were uh, you able to understand him? Did you know what he was saying? Yeah, I mean, somebody says, Ich liebe dich. And then I used to study German leader, uh, you know, and, uh, and when I sang, I, I do sing uh, for a living as well. So when as I As we all know. Ah, so <laughs> so I, I'd actually like to study German. And the other thing is, win, lose, or draw, for the American Jew, at least, it is our experience or my experience that Germany has taken great responsibility for what happened in World War II. So you go to Berlin, and Berlin feels very, very good. Uh, you have in Berlin, as you know, the Reichstag, yep. the Brandenburg Gate, and the Monument to the Holocaust, right there. So that's like America going to Times Square and taking a one-block square, one huge block, dedicated to the Native American, whom we basically killed Is off. Is this woman amazing or what? <laughs> so my experience in Berlin has been excellent, wonderful. I, I run there. They have a, extraordinary museums there, and I, it feels good. I had much more trouble at the dry hussars on my birthday in Vienna, in my, in my hometown. They were much more odd, I would say, odd. Do you know what you know? Felt you means just field boot. Do you know why that is? Because for the censors, when Napoleon took over and they needed the Jews to pay taxes, Jews needed a last name. It used to just be uh, like if it was Jeannie Updike Smith, it would be Jeannie, Jeannie daughter of Irena. That's all it was. It'd be Tova Bat Lila, ter to Terry, the daughter of Lillian. But they needed last names, so the censors, some of them liked Jews and some of them were anti-Semitic. So the censors made fun of the Jews. And my family's named after a field booth. <laughs> Felchu is hardly some kind of aristocratic name. We're not talking about the Rockefellers here. And the Jews with money could pay for prettier names like Rosenberg. You know, beauty, like the, 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 uh, the Mountain of Roses. These beautiful names mm -hmm. uh, were paid for with money. But, so it's very, very interesting. And I, I do love my name because my name is so weird. Anybody who has it is related to me. So we found, because of the Holocaust, we found relatives in Melbourne, um, Buenos Aires, uh, um, of course, uh, Caesarea, Israel, Tivon. And my Austrian cousins moved back to Austria. They, they missed it. They loved it. Roman Halle, the baby she saves, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. he lives in Munich. Can you believe it? He's German. He came. He came for he was opening here. night. He was here for opening night. So on opening night, I had my beloved son, Brandon, in the audience. Mm -hmm. And Irene Gutz, spirit and soul, had her adopted son, Roman Halle, in the audience. And the parallelism was even more stunning than our outfits. Can which you are also, believe that? No, no, it, it was extremely moving. So we called Jeannie up to the stage, which we always do, which is Irena's daughter. So people ooh and ah, and she's very beautiful, and she's very smart, and she's very modest. So you, you can't beat it. It's a big asset. She'll probably get reviewed in the New York Times. Anyway, <laughs> then we followed her with Roman Halla, mm -hmm. and that was the end of everybody. Everybody was, people's legs gave out. Sure. I mean, even mine did. I, I couldn't, uh, so... I hugged him, I hugged the, and in the, in the play, the final scene is with Roman Halla. The, an actor, Scott Clavin, walks on and plays Roman Halla, and I hug him. And then as uh, 
Tova Irena, I hugged this boy, this boy who's now my husband's age. Yes. He's in his 60s. Yes. He's older, you know, he's older than I am and bigger than I am. But I remember the footage of Irena m meeting him and hugging him, you know. Uh, and uh, my son, my son, not to, you know, it's just very touching. And she, but, she believes that he believes that he, that she is responsible for his life. I have two mothers, one who gave me, gave birth to me and one who gave me my life. She gave him his life. She said, ich liebe dich. Her father said, ich liebe dich. Yeah, yeah. Which means, for those who don't know, I love you. And we're going to take a break because we love you. <laughs> Whether you are looking for a total work environment or a combination of business and relaxation, Gurney's Inn Resort, Spa, and Conference Center will provide you with the best of both worlds. Our experienced conference staff will ensure your business gathering will run without a hitch. We have your business solutions. Contact our conference center now. I just knew you would stay with me, and Tova felt you presently. Perfect. In a rain is vow by oh, Dan Gordon. Is she, boy, is she? Look how beautiful. Beautiful, drop dead gorgeous. She's probably half, she is definitely half the size I am. That's no. For sure. Yes, she is, but very nice of you. Guys. She has some legs. <laughs> She's very kind because this Golden May year I had to wear uh, a whole <laughs> legging with uh, var varicose veins. I had these big fire hydrant legs and a fat suit. I was a size 16 and 168 Didn't pounds. Didn't I tell you she's half the size? I have a size 16. People would come from Scarsdale High where I went to high school and they'd say, God, what has happened to Tova Felchu? <laughs> but here I'm redeemed as, as, as Irena Gutz Opdyke. And, and you know, I tell you, this is, she's an extraordinary woman, but this is wonderful for my career. It's wonderful for my career too to be chosen to play a Polish Catholic. Sure. And, and I went all through Poland to make sure I could nail this and honor this. I went to Czestochowa, which is the belly of the Polish Catholic Church, and I was with the clergy, and they took me up to the high altar near the Black Madonna and the miracle of the Black Madonna. You saw Madonna. the Black Madonna? I saw the Black Madonna like this. Woo. I mean, I was like on my knees next to the priests were flanking me. They walked me in from the vestry with them. I came right up to the, 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 the Black Madonna, and I just stayed with the the priests, and then they took me down to their treasury, and that, that church is resplendent with riches. In the seminal part of her life, from about 8 to 14 or 15, she was brought up in Czestochowa, which was abundant in the best part of the Judeo-Christian tradition. The best part of Catholicism was operating in that town. A lot of people were very kindly. They had clergy running around all in white. They're all dressed in white. Mm -hmm. The place was luminescent. People would get healed from the Black Madonna, and they'd give a turquoise necklace. So you have a, 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 a wire going from the back of the cathedral to the front with turquoise, amber, all these necklaces of women hanging. It, it almost looks like a costume jewelry store, except it isn't. There's mm -hmm. semi-precious stones, and there's incrustation of the majesty of the place is extraordinary. What's important about it is not that the diamonds, they're diamonds and rubies, but that there's a sense of abundance and well-being. And she had a mother who said, you see that wounded stork? Take care of that animal. And she nursed a, a stork back to life who had a broken wing, and she nursed it so then it could go away again. And the uh, go away into the into the wild and mm -hmm. live its mm -hmm. life. So the the transition from helping a wounded animal to becoming a, a nurse, a student nurse, to helping a human being is really the same path of of added significance. So she comes on because she she is interviewed by a Holocaust denier. There's a phone call that she has with somebody who said that the Holocaust doesn't exist, and she decides to go into high schools and tell her story that it, she would, to defeat the enemy, she had to speak, and she starts the play with, good morning, my darling children. I am so happy to be here with all of you today, seeing so many beautiful young boys and girls. You know, I look at you, and it seems to me it cannot be so many years ago that I was your age, but it was. Many, many years ago, when I was very close to your ages right now, that I had to make a very important choice. I had to choose between life and death. I did see people murdered in front of me, old people, youngs, women's children. They were murdered right in front of me, and I could do nothing. And then God put me at a crossroads when I was almost exactly your age, 
and he offered me a choice between a mortal and an immortal life, between complicity and redemption, between death and life. I did not ask for it, but he put into my hands the lives of 12 people, into my hands, and I was not much older than you. And she sings, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> she was a great soul, you know, to honor her spirit. You know, there was a person there. When you go into Yad Vashem in Israel and you see the monument to the one million children killed, it's their candles that are reflected into mirrors so that each is a speck of light. It brings to mind the Romeo and Juliet uh, quote, and when he shall die, take him and cut him out in little stars and he shall make the face of heaven so fine that all the world will be in love with night and pay no worship to the garish sun. So what we're saying about Irena Gut is there was a person there. So when Roman Holla walks on stage in the flesh after the show, or uh, uh, Jeannie uh, uh, Opdyke Smith, her daughter, walks on, you know that there was a person there like this, like you, mm -hmm. that did these extraordinary things. It, it really engenders hope. It really engenders hope for all of us. You are going on. This play I hope so. is a message which cannot and will not die. Let us hope we go to Broadway and London and Israel and Poland and Australia, to the English-speaking world and, and, and spread this. And let us hope in the face of the president of Iran that calls Israel a blot on, on the world and that calls the Holocaust a, a, a blatant exaggeration by a people that have no business in being in Jerusalem. Let us hope that for him, this will be an antidote to his poisonous, revisionist point of view. I have talked to people who have seen you on stage and uh, because I didn't so far, and um, not in this role. And, uh, and they've been saying that uh, Debbie Toomer, our reporter, lucky to have her. Thing. This is the most amazing acting job I have ever, ever seen. That's what she said. Well, she's very kind. And the, the part is extremely demanding. You have to play Irena as 70, as 17. And when she narrates, she's 70. When she's in the scene, she's 17. And when she tells you about the Nazis, I play the Nazis. Ah, I know. I'm speaking for everybody who is here in the audience. You look radiant absolutely radiant. really you have a figure girl you have a figure my goodness thank you i i, I swim yeah i can tell. i swam already in your pool i don't know what happened but i can tell you that pool doesn't work for me <laughs> people it's nice this is a nice area of, of i i notice a lot of the women some of them are fit and some of them are full-bodied i wouldn't say you're not fit you're gorgeous you're a renoir there you go So you're going to come back? To Gurney's? Mm -hmm. Are you kidding? Yeah. Just ask me. I'll show up. You know, Golda Meir says, there are people who love you, and there are people who love you and show up. You show up. <laughs> <laughs> and she did show up. So much felt you.